O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, it's awfully good to be back with you. I was on retreat last week, which was wonderful and meaningful. Uh, thank you to everybody who led worship. I think we need, need to do that again, even when I'm not gone. It was lovely. And I want to thank especially our wardens, Carol Forsyth and Mike Bruce, who were in charge in my absence. Thank you. You know, I got to my room at the retreat center, and you know, I was going to be there a week, so I unpacked stuff. I gathered up all my toiletries, and I carried them into the bathroom, and I was, you know, putting them around the sink, and at some point I looked up, and I saw myself in the mirror, and I thought, ooh, <laughs> that flight must have been harder on you than you thought. You're not looking so good. Uh, so I finished, you know, setting up, and I went back out into the room, and there was another mirror out there, which I glanced at, and I thought, hey, wait a minute, I look pretty normal. What, what's the deal? Which one was accurate? Um, the sermon today is going to be something of a two-parter. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, distortions of faith that enslave us. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can determine if the voice we are following is the voice of God. The majority of the book of Galatians is Paul actually having himself a pretty good come apart and without, not without cause. He opens his letter with the expected salutations and blessings and then he launches into this passionate, frustrated bit of writing. I am astonished, he says, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ, and you are turning to a different gospel. What's the deal? People. He rants on for about two more chapters, and he gets pretty worked up until finally he says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? What has happened, people? What is going on, church? What's got Paul so upset? Well, it seems that some teacher or teachers have come to Galatia, and they have told the church there that the Jewish law still needs to be observed even in this new covenant. And you know, that's not really surprising. Remember, this is very early on in the emergence of Christianity. Galatians is one of the very earliest Christian texts we have, written probably only around 25 years after the resurrection. So that's like reporting something that happened in 1998, folks. The early church is still trying very hard to figure out and make sense of this Jesus experience that they have had. Paul is angry because the gift of the Spirit has been set aside and distorted by this teaching. Like most of us, the folks in this church seem drawn to or maybe more secure in the tangible, known, external, visible signs of faith. In this case, male circumcision specifically, but also other constraints of the Jewish law. Paul insists that freedom in Christ is freedom from all these requirements. Freedom can be a dangerous thing. And our passage describes some of the ways that freedom is used and often misused, used in ways that hurt, ways that disrespect. Paul uses the word flesh here, and he's referring perhaps to things that we do with our bodies, but not necessarily to our bodies themselves. Please remember, these bodies have been declared very good. That word flesh is used sometimes in scripture to refer to our physical bodies, but also as it is here, to describe decisions and actions that originate from the self. They are proceeding out of the unchanged part of it, the part of us that has not yet been transformed by God's presence. So you can see the juxtaposition in our passage of things that we decide and do originating in our self and things that we decide and do that are led by the Spirit. In all his talk of freedom from the Jewish law, Paul is clear that doesn't mean disregarding it. He says that to live in freedom, 
in this spirit-led way is actually to fulfill the whole law. As summed up in this passage from Leviticus, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Galatians are freed from enslavement to the law specifically for the purpose of turning around and being slaves to one another in love and thereby fulfilling the law. This realm of the Spirit suffusing relationships, guiding decisions and actions is what Paul is so very passionate about. It was a draw to the Jewish law that distorted the gospel for the folks in Galatia. The invitation in today's passage for us is to consider the distortions that so easily compromise our living the gospel. What is it that we are set free from in order to love our neighbor? I read a very troubling article this week. Actually, I read several very troubling articles this week. Uh, but this one was by Mark Michael Emerson. He is a professor of sociology at the University of Illinois, Chicago. In his research, he discovered a disturbing pattern. Two-thirds of practicing white Christians repeatedly placed being white ahead of being Christian. Two-thirds were identified indicated that defending and identifying with whiteness was more important than living out the teachings of our faith. Dr. Emerson's methods were solid. This is a scholarly study after all. He didn't just go up to people and say, which one's more important to you, being white or being a Christian? And his findings, surprisingly, were not dependent, and listen for this folks, they were not dependent on political affiliation geographic location, age, education, income, or gender. It would appear that whiteness is something that enslaves we who are white, something from which we must be set free to love our neighbor. Now that's a really big distortion and one that systemically touches on many other things. But the things that pull us off center don't have to be that big. Fear, money, confusion. Those of us who are part of the 12-step community will be familiar with a very handy bit of guidance. guidance. HALT is the acrostic. Hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. When we're in any of those conditions, we're vulnerable to distortions of all kinds. All of these are factors that can scramble our hearing and prevent us from receiving guidance from the Spirit. So, how do you know when you're being led by the Spirit rather than by the unchanged, untransformed pockets that are a part of you? Here's the pivot to part two. If you haven't already read it, I commend to you the reflection that Carol Metzger offered to us this last Thursday. Carol talks about some of the things that help her listen for and hear God's voice, silence, stillness, self-examination. How you answer that question might be similar or it might be very different. And here's the weird thing, your answers might be different in different circumstances. I know I used to be a little naive about this. I figured if I felt good about a particular decision or action, well, that must be God's leading. So I followed my emotions. If I could see many good things about this particular decision, well, surely that was God's directing me. So I followed obvious benefits. I've also swung way over to the other side. If this is something I really want to do, well, that must be proof that this is not what God wants me to do. You know, I'm just following my ego or something. You can drive yourself to distraction trying to figure this out, right? We read, though, in today's passage, that whatever the situation, when the Holy Spirit is leading and we are following, 
there will be fruit born in us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And please notice that this is the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruits. It's one thing, and it's characterized by all these, in, in all these ways. We can be assured that it is God speaking when our lives and experience are bearing this fruit. When we see this fruit being born, we can know we're on track. I don't know about you, but when I hear this list of descriptors, love, joy, peace, kindness, all, oh, it's just all so sweet. And it kind of looks like this. It's beautiful, and it's enjoyable. You can look at it, and maybe it makes you smile. And that's part of it. But we know that there is a thicker, gnarlier version of all these characteristics that's nearer to their true essence. And when we get down to that truer essence, because they are the fruit of the Spirit, we can be assured that we are nearer to that Spirit, nearer to God. That thicker way of characterizing the fruit of the Spirit looks more like this. This is a Kiwano melon. There was a giant version of this at the Jewel, but when I got back there, they were all gone. So we, so we have to settle for this little mini fruit of the Spirit. It's pretty dense, and you can see it has hard spikes all over it. If it were much heavier, it would hurt to hold it. To our temperate climate eyes, it looks really strange. I hear it was even used uh, in a Star Trek episode <laughs> to uh, depict alien fruit. Love is the intention and the action that seeks the well-being of the other first, sometimes doing things that other person doesn't really think is terribly loving, but that are needful for their wholeness. Joy is so much more than happiness. Peace, way more than swimming along through life untroubled. Patience? <laughs> well, that's a lovely thing to receive, but an immensely difficult practice to live by. Kindness is hard work, too. It takes time and attention. Generosity, not only with our money, but generosity with truth, grace, compassion, and care. Faithfulness that leads us to do what we're supposed to do and be who we're supposed to be. Gentleness. Huh. Easy to be gentle with children and small animals. Difficult to be gentle with our enemy, with those with whom we disagree, and even with ourselves. And self-control? Wow, I'm not even sure there's a warm, fuzzy side to that. That's just flat out hard. I learned something else about the Kiwano melon this week. It has nine specific benefits for our bodies. Nine characteristics of the fruit of the spirit, nine benefits of the Kiwano melon. I was going to draw some specific parallels, but it all got just a little too precious. So, suffice it to say, when the fruit of the spirit, as it is being born in our, when the fruit of the spirit is being born in our lives, it nourishes us, it strengthens us, it sustains this body, all of us, in the difficult and joyful spirit-led life. And that nourishing spirit, then, is offered up at the metaphorical table we spread for our neighbors and our friends, for our families, and for our society. In these weeks in the season after Pentecost, as we explore what it means to follow God's spirit, keep the gnarly, prickly fruit of the spirit, all those characteristics, in mind. Where you find it, live it. Where you find only its absence, well, that's where the broken places are in the world. 
The undistorted gospel is specifically for the broken places. It is there, in those broken places, that you and I are called to bear this fruit, to bear its gnarly, thick love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Amen.